Well, let's go to First Thessalonians chapter four, and toward the end of the chapter, because we'll be primarily in First Thessalonians chapter five. But if you'll find First Thessalonians chapter four, that would be a great start. help when you're studying the scripture, uh, and, and we really need to have uh, a class again on just the hows, the, the methods for studying the Bible. There are a lot of different Bible study methods, and of course there are some methods which are occasional methods, ways that you should sometimes study the Bible, like for instance, a lot of folks, uh, I actually tragically a lot of preachers use the Strong's Concordance Bible study method, that is they look up a word and then they just look up every verse that the word is used in, and then they preach a message just using that word. And it's basically what I call the doctrine of the word. Not the word of God, but the single word. And they create a doctrine out of a word. And words don't have doctrines. Words have individual meaning, and then the words in a sentence I have convey a larger meaning, and words in a context convey a larger meaning than that. But sometimes it's a real help just to study a word. Uh, and that, that's, a, that's you know, a way of studying. Sometimes you'll learn some things uh, by studying a word, and I think that's just fine. But when you're studying the Bible, you really need to uh, learn more about contextual study, learn more about studying uh, the background. And when you begin uh, studying like a, a letter, like the, the letter of 1 Thessalonians, you use uh, some questions at the beginning that you establish answers for, which really help you to understand some basic truths to keep you from putting the words and the sentences into a context with, in which they don't belong. Now, I'm not trying to uh, I'm not trying to bore you this evening or even lose you by uh, talking about these things, and I hope I haven't. But suffice it to say tonight that it, a way when you study the Bible. Uh, to be helped a great deal as you are studying is to remember the epistles, which an epistle is a word for letter, that the epistles are normally written to churches, and churches are comprised with saved people. There's a lot of false doctrine by just taking letters that are written to save people and putting the meaning or the sentences or the, the statements in the letters applying them to lost people. And so this is, uh, this is a good reminder. Let me give you a for instance. Lordship salvation. I don't, I don't want to get into exactly what that is if you don't know what the terms are. But lordship salvation essentially teaches that the, at least the confirmation of your salvation, the proof of your being saved, to some degree has to do with the level at which you make Jesus the Lord of your life. Now, Lordship's a Bible doctrine. Uh, the, the fact is, Jesus is Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, but Lordship is what you make Jesus to be as a requirement for your salvation. And uh, usually it's used in the context of discipleship. Usually they'll take commands that are given by Jesus for His disciples and they'll make <coughs> those prerequisites or requirements in order to be saved. And uh, 1 John is a letter that is written to believers. Now, we're not preaching 1 John tonight, but I'm just using this for, for instance, an example for you. 1 John begins with, Beloved, my little children, uh, and terms of endearment for family, family members. And 1 uh, John uses the word fellowship from the beginning all the way through the end. And the purpose statement of 1 John is fellowship. Fellowship is a family term. It's a friendship term. You don't have fellowship in the Scripture in every context with the lost or unsaved. But many individuals will take 1 John and take things that 1 John says and put them into the context of a lost person or make them uh, be about being saved when the letter's already written to save people. And the preconceived or the foundational understanding when the letter's written is, I'm writing to save people. Not writing to lost people. So I'm not telling you how to get saved. I'm telling you how to have fellowship. And I'll tell you something. If you don't establish that before you begin studying 1 John, I mean, it's common sense. It's not 
well, I need to view it from this vantage point in order to come up with the doctrine I want. No, it's, this is the way it's written. This is what it means. You get the wrong context, man. You'll take uh, verses in 1 John, and you'll be making them say that unless you do certain things, you're not saved. And that isn't the way it's written at all. It's not the way it's intended to be understood Amen. at all. And you know the same is pretty true in our context this evening. Uh, if you take the truths that are being taught about the resurrection and about the coming of Jesus in the clouds to call up the saints, and you put them in the context of a system of theology mm -hmm. that either stems from Catholicism or uh, stems from the Reformed theology or theological perspective, which comes from Catholicism, mm -hmm. then you will put the Scripture in a context where without even just reading it on, for face value and taking it to mean precisely what it says as written, uh, you'll get all messed up and you'll lose you'll lose that aspect that believers have, which is the blessed hope. You'll lose the blessing of the blessed hope. And my friend, Jesus coming, Jesus coming for believers is a long for sought after event. Just as we ended in our context this morning in Revelation, even so come quickly. Jesus coming is an event that believers have every reason to anticipate and look forward to, mm -hmm. not fear. And so let's read our context this evening, beginning in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul's writing this letter, and he said to the church at Thessalonica, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. That's an important phrase, by the way. A lot of doctrinal implications about the location where we meet the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another <coughs> with these words. And then he goes on further to say in chapter 15, But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they... Notice that word, they. That's an exclusive word. In other words, not us, but they. We're excluded from that group. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in the darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, I love that verse. Verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, please help us this evening to be convinced not only of the truth about the next event on your calendar, but to be convinced about your character. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Righteous never fear. Righteous have never have need to fear God's wrath. And that's so important, and that's one of the reasons we read so far into our context this evening, because the reality that God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> is so important. My friend, uh, the kind of a God who would tamper with people's lives or for his own pleasure torture or torment or cause people who love him to go through things at his hand which are unnecessarily judgment is so out of the character of God. God 
God is so against destroying or judging ungodly people like ourselves that He judged His own Son instead. And, and so an accusation that God has appointed believers to wrath is a false accusation against God. Now, I don't want to deal too directly with current theological trends because that's what they are actually, theological trends. And I find that theological trends are like false teachers. They come on the scene and then their fruits destroy them and they go back off the scene. And so you just really don't want to validate or give a historical place to false teachers because there's just no end to that. Now sometimes you have to address false doctrine and false teachers. But something that's important for you as a believer is you most certainly will run into, if you have not already in the near future, individuals that think that the tribulation, the tribulation that we study and saw, uh, both the three and a half, first three and a half years and the second three and a half years in the Revelation or the tribulation which is referred to in Daniel 12 or in other places, uh, the tribulation that's referred to in Matthew 24 and 25 or, and, and so forth. The notion that that is intended any, in any part for believers, my friend, is a contradiction and an assault on the character of God. And that's all I want to say about it because it, a false doctrine always uh, morphs <coughs> into a different form and you just can't keep up with all the forms of it. You, you call out or you identify a specific group and the problem with that is that there will be a new group later. You just can't keep up with all those things. But one of the things we as believers need to, to find uh, an important thing to do is to know what the truth is so that error is obviously an error. Okay, so one of the first things we begin in our context this evening is in 1 Thessalonians 4, and the context is that Paul is writing a letter to a church without any rebukes in it, by the way, and he's writing a letter reminding them about something for which they are validly concerned. They have a valid concern, and their concern is people that knew the Lord Jesus died and we didn't think anyone was going to die before Jesus came. Do you remember the, the words of the angel who stood next to the 11 disciples when Jesus ascended up to heaven? What did they say? This same Jesus which you saw ascend into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And the disciples said, good, I hope he comes quick. Things are looking a little hot around here. And well, let's get this gospel preached around the world and then Jesus needs to come. And <laughs> I mean, that literally is their mindset. And all the believers in the first century church, including John, who concludes the letter of Revelation, John, the only apostle that we believe was not killed uh, before, before he ended his life in a more natural way, though he was certainly tortured and, uh, and brutally mistreated, John ends his letter, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And so the believers, the first century church, anticipated they had a notion they had an understanding that Jesus was going to come the way that He went, and they expected Him to come in their lifetime. And one of the things we said this morning is that if they expected Jesus to come in their lifetime, and He hasn't, it's been 2,000 years, it is not as Peter said that the scoffers say, where's the promise of His coming? It's not that He's not coming or that He's forgotten to come. It's that He's very, very merciful. And he's very long-suffering, and there have been generations upon generations of individuals who have become his children as a result of his long-suffering. But Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon. And he's certainly coming sooner than when the believers in the first century, uh, sooner for us than for them. In other words, we're 2,000 years nearer the coming of the Lord Jesus. And I'm not a date setter. Don't take what I'm about to say and run with it and make me be setting dates but God did great things about every uh, 2,000 years. There's just great, you, you look at God's calendar and there are 400 year periods and there are 1,500 year and 2,000 year periods. And uh, the 2,000 year mark's a big one. And so the Lord Jesus could tarry another 2,000 years, but I think he'll probably come in my lifetime. And I'm supposed to think that. I'm supposed to love his coming. But I'm not simply thinking that because I'm naive and I'm just choosing to believe what I'm supposed to. 
I have every reason to think the Lord Jesus is coming soon. He said He's going to. Okay, so now the believers at the church at Thessalonica then were understandably uh, confused and understandably bothered by the fact that their loved ones died. They didn't think anyone would die. They thought they were pretty invincible. And so the Apostle Paul wrote him a letter and he said, uh, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. And so what he's saying is, you know, I mean, the sorrow, if you think that, they, well, maybe they weren't saved. I mean, if you know that Jesus is coming and somebody dies before Jesus comes, one of your natural deductions, or at least one of the thoughts that crosses your mind is, did they not really believe in Jesus? Is that why they died? And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. I don't want you to sorrow, and at least not like those that have no hope. For if we believe uh, that Jesus Christ died and rose again, uh, he, he goes on to say, Even so them also which sleep in Jesus shall God bring with Him. So they're not in the ground. They're not gone. They didn't miss the resurrection. They're not stuck there forever. Uh, God's going to bring them with Him. Now think of this. The saints, which were already buried before the, before the death of Christ on the cross, what happened to them? Remember when the veil was rent in twain? There was a great earthquake. What happened? They rose. And the graves opened, and they came out of the graves, and they went into Jerusalem. And then, of course, they ascended with Jesus. Jesus took them to heaven. So now, if the saints are all out of the ground, and you bury saints in the ground, and the resurrection's already happened, they missed the resurrection. You would have been better to die before the cross than after the cross and be stuck in the ground with no resurrection. See, that's a little bit of a quandary. It's a, it's a, it's a doctrinal issue for the church and for the, for the believers. And so Jesus said God's going to bring them with Him. The idea is He's going to bring them to Him. It's not uh, He's going to bring them back from heaven with Him. It's that He's going to bring them, them to Him. And He's talking about their physical bodies, which will certainly be resurrected. He goes on to say, This we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now, a we, this pronoun, of course, is plural, but it is an inclusive pronoun. In other words, we is myself and you. And this is Paul saying, me and you. You and I, however you'd like to properly say it. And so he said, we which are alive and remain, indicating that Paul has full expectation of being there when the Lord Jesus comes for his saints. A friend, I ask you a practical question. If that's so, do you think that Paul was thinking that God was going to come and pour out his wrath on the believers? Or do you think that God was do you think that Paul was under the impression that the Lord Jesus was going to come and take his saints? Huh? The yeah, it's the latter, not the former, isn't it? Man, it ain't rocket surgery, folks. It ain't brain science. It's not that. It's not that difficult, right? Uh, I'm sorry, but the the implication, the context is just as plain as the nose on your face. And if your nose nose is long enough, you ought to be able to see it. So, uh, verse uh, 15. This, or, I'm sorry, verse 15. This we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive, we inclusive. We Paul says, I anticipate being alive and remaining in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. The word prevent means to go before, go ahead of time, or get in the way of. And so we're not going to beat them, uh, but the Bible says, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So God, the Lord Jesus Himself is going to descend from heaven, and then notice geographically, or not geographically as the case actually is, where we'll meet Him. Then we which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together. Together with whom? Well, with those which are asleep. And that's going to be kind of neat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, there are a couple of things that I've concluded about the Lord's coming that I hope happen for me somehow. Here's one thing. I want to be, I want to be in an I told you so situation when the Lord Jesus comes. By that, I mean I want to be telling somebody about Jesus and they'd be like, yeah, there he is. See, I told you he was coming. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just want... Let me tell you, Jesus is coming again. You need to believe in Him. And then, and then there's this, this trumpet, this archangel shouting, and, 
And what? Yeah, I told you. He was coming. And I'd like to be in a graveyard with people uh, that are believers. Yeah, and see, look, I told you. <laughs> and then we're all going to take off. And it's not going to be like these silly uh, movies and books make it where, you know, aliens abduct people and they vanish. It's going to be where literally we come in like manner as the Lord Jesus. There's people going to watch us go up. We're going. We're going to visibly go up. You're going to see Jesus and you're going to see the saints come out of the graves and you're going to see the saints, uh, the saints' bodies, I should say, come out of the graves because their souls are with the Lord. To be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. But you're going to see the bodies come out of the graves and you're going to see the believers all go up with those bodies. We're going to go together. We're not going to leave them behind. And that's the picture here. And then so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay? But then Paul says in chapter 15, he said, uh, But of the times and seasons, brethren, he said, Ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord uh, shall so cometh as a thief in the night. Okay. The catching up, the gathering up, the snatching up, the rapture, and that's a fine word, is going to happen and it shouldn't catch any believer by surprise. But the day of the Lord will catch unbelievers by surprise. There's a big difference, isn't there? If you read Matthew 24, 25, when the question is asked, when shall these things be? What shall be the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus <laughs> explicitly tells his disciples that there aren't any events that are a sign of his coming to destroy the world. He says, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes, and they say, lo, here is Christ, and lo, there, and that, so forth. He says, don't say that you be not troubled, for the end is not yet. He says, here's what the signs mean. I love it. I love to take, when I start a prophecy conference or series, I love to take a newspaper and show events in the Middle East and read it to people. And while I'm reading, people go, hmm, ah, while I'm reading it, they're like, oh, pastor's going to tell us what this means. And I say, you know what this means? Nothing. Doesn't mean a thing in the world. Throw the newspaper away. There's always been wars and rumors of wars. There's always been earthquakes. There's always been weather. Uh, they, you know, it's just always happened. And uh, it's not a sign of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I've been scared by some weather. I have been made to stop and reflect by catastrophic events. But those things are not the sign of the Lord Jesus coming. The sign of the Lord Jesus coming is going to be, it's going to come like a thief in the night. And the people he's going to get by surprise are the people that live in darkness and they're going to be sleeping. Uh, or, I'm sorry, they're going to be doing wickedness. And we don't do that. We don't sleep. We're not sleeping, the idea here is. And the word uh, sleep is not the same sleep as die as it is in chapter 4. It's the actual word sleep. So we're not to sleep. In that way. Okay, so look at this. You yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now you can take day, the great day, that great and terrible day, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, the day of judgment. And in all those instances when we say day in that sense, we're talking about that time, that time of judgment when God is meeting out His wrath. We're not talking about Christ returning. Where's the location we're going to meet the Lord? In the air. In the air. So when we talk about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not talking about Christ coming for His saints. The second coming, every description for the second coming has the Lord touching down on earth. His feet are going to touch down on the, on the Mount of Olives. And that's going to be the second advent or the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is not going to meddle with the affairs of this world when He comes to get His saints. He's coming to take us out, and then things are going to start happening, taking place. And then His wrath is going to be poured out uh, in the, those seven years of tribulation. And all seven years of tribulation are the hand of God and at the plan of God. Uh, the nonsense that people teach that the first three and a half years of tribulation are pre-wrath, like it's not the wrath of God in the first three years. No, it's escalating. It is literally the tribulation that starts like this bad. And then it just gets worse and worse and worse until literally no one can survive it. Uh, but it's the wrath of God. And the whole seven years of tribulation are tribulation at the hand of God. Not that, then that's how individuals play uh, games to try to get around really, really obvious truths in the Scriptures by taking and dividing up the 
three, both three and a half years of the tribulation period. Okay, now, we, I just want to finish. I just want to look at First Thessalonians 5. I'm not preaching about all of those things this evening, but I want to preach comfort for believers. In verse 3, the, what they're going to be saying, just, just like in the days of Noah, for when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And it's sort of like, uh-oh, it's time when you are with child. And it's going to be that way. Oh, everything's fine. I think I can make it. Let's go to the theme park. And then you're on the roller coaster and all of a sudden, ah! I, I, maybe maybe uh, ladies with child don't ride roller coasters. Some, some do. Some do. So just to qualify there. <laughs> but ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Let me just offer a little bit of commentary. If the wrath of God, the day of the Lord, began at the midpoint of the tribulation period, allowing that that were true, then would it not also be true that we'd know exactly when the Lord Jesus would be coming? It contradicts the truth that Jesus said, No man knoweth, not even the Son of Man, but the Father. If Jesus couldn't tell His disciples when He's coming, my friend, trust me, it's not going to be, oh, well, Jesus didn't know when He's going to come, but now we can date things from the beginning of the <coughs> tribulation period. Nonsense. Mm -hmm. We will date the beginning of the tribulation period from the time when the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the sky and calls us up. And believers anticipate that that will be today. Every day since Jesus ascended and the angel told the disciples, this same Jesus shall so come in like manner. Mm -hmm. Now moving forward. Uh, let's see here, verse 4, 5, or 4, But ye, brethren, not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. That day is not going to overtake us because we're not in darkness. There will be folks that are living in darkness that will be surprised at the wrath of God. And it, it is going to be, um, it's going to be an amazing example of deliberate blindness for individuals to be surprised at the day of wrath, the day of God's wrath. Isn't it? As we studied through Revelation this past year, isn't it notable how in your face God is? You can't say that the events that are happening are, well, this is, you know, a catastrophic natural disaster. No, it's God judging. There's an angel in heaven blowing a trumpet, boom, this wrath is poured out, and this thing, this judgment begins. Okay, now, ye are all children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Okay, so we're not going to be surprised. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And the idea of watching here isn't don't ever go to bed at night because, you know, Jesus might come. Have you ever had that, you ever had that dream? You know, I'm talking about the one where somehow you bounce out of bed and land on your feet. Like, I can do ninja moves when I get scared in the middle of the night. Uh, like where literally I can sink myself down into the bed bounce up and land on, standing up on the bed. Like, wow. I, I remember being a kid and just hearing the trumpet. And just, tsh, 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 and, whoa, you know, like, oh, no. <laughs> and uh, uh, that hasn't happened since I've been married, thankfully, for my wife, because I'm too heavy to be jumping up on the bed like that. <laughs> but uh, we're not going to be surprised. And the idea is not stay awake. The idea is... Just watch. The idea is watch. Be aware. Watch is an awareness term. And you won't be surprised. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Let's stop here just for a moment of application. If Jesus might come at any minute, it might be a good thing to not be doing some things when Jesus comes. Now, it isn't as though God's Spirit is not omnipresent. It isn't as though God isn't here watching anyway. Isn't as though, well, when Jesus gets here, He's going to see what I'm doing. No, He sees what you're doing. And you really ought to take the notion that we don't want to be found doing something or be found in the wrong place or wrong mind or wrong, wrong attitude when Jesus comes. We ought to just take it back to the logical conclusion that watching means being ready all the time. It's just practical. So watching means being ready for the Lord Jesus to come. And it's sort of like... Uh, when you're going to have company at your house. And the way here's how it happens in our house. And don't anybody tell my wife that I told you this. 
but what happens in our house is our house is generally speaking compared with most of what I've experienced in my life it's mostly pretty neat our house is pretty clean um, just it's pretty clean all the time isn't it Anthony mm -hmm. yeah our, it's a clean house we like it that way we like living in a clean house um, but if we're going to have company what my wife does is takes everything out of everywhere and cleans the house she pulls out the couch, pulls out every recliner, she rolls up the rug, she puts the chairs on the table, she goes in the closet, pulls everything out of the closet, she goes in the drawers and pulls everything out of the drawers, and our house just looks like it got blown up. And it goes from being clean, I'm like, sweetheart, our house is just fine. Yeah, no it's not, it's a mess, there's dust under everything, or whatever. And she takes it all apart and cleans everything. <laughs> I'm not making this up, this is really true. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and then she starts, yeah, you should help. And then she starts getting a little bit desperate. She starts getting desperate the nearer the coming of the company is. And you're the people that cause all this when you come by our house. <laughs> <laughs> and <coughs> my irritation level goes just a little bit up. By the, you know, you don't feel comfortable sitting in a recliner while your wife is running around like a busy bee cleaner. You know what I mean? It's like, I want to sit in the recliner and just say, hey, we're going to have company, let's relax and just enjoy the day. You no, know, let's tear everything out and, uh, you know, clean everything. It's just fine. Good way. So then you, you kind of get irritated. You're like, hey, baby, you know, just stop tearing stuff up. Well, let's just have company. You know, just stop worrying about that stuff. And, and uh, it's just like that. So, yeah, you should help. You know, you could, you could help me with this. And then, um, about oh five or ten minutes before company is supposed to arrive, everything gets shoved back, put everything back where it goes, and it's like, <sighs> and you can relax because you're ready for company to come. Now I felt like we were ready to begin with, <laughs> but we evidently were not to the way we should have been. And uh, when you're actually ready, then you can sit down, and then you can breathe a sigh of relief, and everything's the way it's supposed to be. You know, she made things smell nice. I don't know why smelling good means it's so important, but everything smells nice. And everything's ready for company, and uh, you're ready. You're watching. And the idea of watching really is being in readiness. If you work for the for the military, for the Navy, and at least this used to be true, and I think it still is, uh, and really any ship that's that's well maintained, when a ship leaves port. You'd think, you know, hey, we're sailing away, and they sing their songs, and everybody's on the bow and all that, and now we're all going to relax until we come into port. No, as soon as you leave port, they start polishing things, scraping rust, oiling things, start working on the ship. And they work on the ship the entire time of the voyage, so when they come into port, it's ship shape. You know, the, the analogy of a ship coming in beaten and battered and with its sails torn and its mast broken, that actually isn't reality. A ship is in never better condition than when it comes into port. And it is in worse condition when it's in port and it leaves. So the idea of watching is working, preparing, getting things ready. And we as believers, if we practically are going to be like those that are not of the night, if we're going to be watching, we're going to be working. We're going to be trying to get ourselves ship shape, if you will. We're going to be trying to get our ministries, ship shape, get things ready for Jesus when He comes. I'm always ashamed, to be honest with you, at my level of competence as a pastor. I always, you know, there's just so many loose ends and so many things that at the end of a year are left undone. And, you know, I think of people, I, I made an accidental call uh, yesterday evening. I called the wrong geo. The geo that comes to church, I called him. He was the wrong number when I was trying to call the other Giovanni. And when I called him, I said, hey, man, you know, and invite when he showed up, he was, wasn't the Giovanni he was supposed to be. He was a different Giovanni. I mean, he was supposed to come, but he wasn't the one I was thinking I was talking to. Today, or yesterday, I accidentally called the other Giovanni when I was trying to call this Giovanni. And he said he was going to come tonight. And I thought, Giovanni, you know, last time I saw him, Anthony and I sat down with him at uh, the garlic knot, and we led him to the Lord, didn't we, Anthony? The last time we saw that guy. And you know, it's been almost a year since he's been in church. And you know, that's my fault. It's my fault. I've been going to call him I don't know how many times. And just haven't followed up like I should have. He needs to get baptized. So is the other Geo. We need to do some Geo dunking as boys get here. Uh, both Geos. But the, but the reality is, is that I can look back, and I'll be honest with you, my mental capacity is sometimes lacking 
I, I just, I've got to get more organized. I've got to be better at things because I want to, when the Lord Jesus comes, have everything done, everything ready. Be able to go, ah, oh, glad you're here. Not thinking, oh man, I should have followed up on that contact. I should have gone after that person that was open to the gospel and said, you want to talk to me sometime. Or, 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 or. And it's important for us as believers to know that the coming of the Lord Jesus is not a dreaded event because of judgment. But the coming of Jesus is an anticipated event and we need to be ready when He comes. And we ought to have a degree of fear at not being ready. At being found. It's not, oh, you know, the, we're not ready and so we're not going to make it to heaven. No, we're going to make it to heaven. That's already settled. That's already done. But I want to be ready when Jesus comes. And you know, I just need to get a list of things that need to be done. Just be pulling things out of the closet. Pulling things out from under the bed. And pulling things uh, away from the wall. And overturning things. And just getting things ship -shaped. Because when Jesus comes, I want to be able to have everything done the way that it ought to be. And that's why the Bible says in verse 8, Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We've got an appointment, but the appointment is not to God's wrath. It is to deliverance or salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of comfort in that, isn't there, believer? You find as much comfort there as I do, and I hope that that settles you about the next event on God's calendar and helps you desire to be watching so that the day doesn't overtake you, like it will those who are like those in the day of Noah, saying, you know, everything's the way it was, and Jesus isn't coming. Father, please help us to watch. Remind us of the importance of it. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would, uh, would more aggressively manifest its presence, his presence, so that, so that we'd be aware of that. We don't just wait for Jesus to come when we'll be caught unready but that the Holy Spirit is very aware of what the state of affairs the way they are as we, as we are now. We thank you for these truths. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for being here tonight. God bless you. I hope you have a fantastic week. You're dismissed. All right.